colleagues, now that the dogs have been officially arrested in the prison, <laughs> uh, we can now sing, dance, jump up and down. And it's my pleasure to go to the stage our first keynote speaker, Prof. Tatiana Klein from the City College of New York. She's going to introduce herself. Let's welcome Prof. Tatiana. Tobela, Macharoni Aburi. Buenos dias and good morning. I'm so thrilled to be here. This is my first time speaking in South Africa, the first time speaking on the continent of Africa. So um, I'm very excited to share with you and bring what um, I've been doing in New York. And again, it is from New York. I'm not an expert in South Africa, I'm, so I'm going to share with you what I know. And I hope what you'll be doing over this time is to make the connections with the dogs. Have you heard this song, Who Let the Dogs Out? <laughs> <laughs> So I'm thrilled to be here, as I said, and um, I'm going to be focusing on migration because the reason languages come into contact is because of people. People move, people are um, isolated, people become integrated, apartheid happens, apartheid is break, broken down, and languages come into contact, but really it's not the languages, it's the people. And through the people, that's where we have to come to some common understanding. And through languages and through our cultures, that's where that happens. And that's where this is going to be happening in the next two days. So I'm going to talk with you today about cyclical migration, because often people think about migration as you start at one point, point A, and you go to point B. And yes, but that's not the whole story, right? Sometimes you go from point A to point B, back to point A, and then sometimes to point C or D. So that's been the, the interest in my work um, at the City College of New York, where I met the Ketty and that, um, my next was there as well through the CUNY Art Program. So I feel like we're having a, a beautiful reunion here. And I want to share with you a little bit about what's going on in New York, in the United States, and our neighbors, um, our southern neighbors of Mexico. And my work is, um, I also try to disrupt academia because I know that we write these articles that nobody reads and nobody can even understand half the time. <laughs> so what I try to do is bring in more multimodal work. So um, here you're gonna see some photography. I'm not a photographer, but I work with an amazing photographer, Tim Porter, so you'll see some of his work. I'm also um, not a videographer, but I work with an amazing filmmaker, so I'll show you a film as well. So we have a lot to do in the next hour or so, so I'm gonna just jump right in. Um, so the, the overview of the agenda is, first I want to tell you a little bit about myself, right? Um, I was charged with that by our chair, so I will, list, I will listen to the directions. I don't always do that, but I will do it today. Um, I want to frame what migration looks like, especially in the context of the United States, and share with you a study on return migration, looking at elementary school students, and here I know you say primary school students, but you understand me either way, right? Um, secondary and tertiary students. Then I will screen Una Vida Dos Países, Children and Youth Back in Mexico. It's a short documentary, it's about 30 minutes. It is also a multilingual documentary. I'll share some resources and future work and end with a poem, because I think poems can be really powerful. So we're all doing, whatever work you do, you do it because of your story. You do it because of your journey. And I think that's especially the case in education, where many of us are here because Often something negative happened to us, and we want to make those right, right those wrongs. Some of us are here because we've had very positive experiences, but I think it's more negative than positive for many of us. Um, so my um, experience is that I was actually born in what was the Soviet Union and what is now the country of Latvia, in the capital of Riga. Um, it's on the Baltic Sea. There I am with my dad. It's really cold. I don't miss that at all. Um, we came to the United States when I was five and a half. We are Jewish, and because of the anti-Semitism, we were able to get refugee status, leave to the United States. As a refugee, you get a lot of support. So um, the Jewish Center in Columbus, Ohio, paid for our flights. 
We had to pay them back, but still, that's a huge support. They showed us to an apartment, they took us to the grocery store, they helped my parents with English lessons. So that was kind of like, wow, we got a lot of support coming here. And then I saw what was happening to other immigrants in the United States, and it was not only they were not getting any of those supports, but they were getting obstacles one after the other. So that's kind of where my interest in looking at migration and languages came. So here I am when um, I was around 12 years old, um, that was me and my mom, and we were becoming naturalized American citizens. So by government definition, I'm now an American, I'm a naturalized citizen, but um, I see that America doesn't accept everybody. And um, so this is the work that I do because of that, because of my own background. So when we talk about immigration, what exactly are we talking about? Well, first, it's about families. It's about families being unified, while at the very same time being separated. And you're always unified and sep from, to some people and separated from the others. Immigration is about borders. And let's remember that these borders are not um, naturally created. They're created by humans to create divisions and to create hierarchies among people in different places. Immigration is about belonging. So who counts and who doesn't count? Who gets to be a citizen and who doesn't get to be a citizen? And who decides? That's a big um, debate we're having, we continue to have. Immigration is about economies. Local economies, national economies, global economies, right? It's all about money. And also just the act of people crossing borders is about money. So people coming from Mexico to the United States hire something called a coyote. Right, a coyote, like somebody who will smuggle you across. That's a business. When they cross into the United States and they're detained, they get put into these private detention centers. That's a business, right? When they want to apply to become a US citizen, it's a crazy amount of money. That's a business, right? So immigration is inextricably tied to economies. Ultimately, immigration is about surviving with the end goal of thriving. People don't leave their home, their culture, their family, their language because it's fun. People go on vacation because it's fun. But you migrate because you feel like you have no other choice, because you feel like you, you need to survive and where you are, you're, you're not able to survive. People migrate because of safety. They're not safe in their home country, so they go to a new country to feel safer. Sometimes that's the case, but sometimes immigrants are targeted in these countries as well, so they also don't feel safe in these other places. Immigration is about accepting or rejecting our differences. In the United States, people are freaking out because the immigrants aren't white. So we're becoming darker skin, we're becoming more multilingual, and for some people, that really scares them. So they push back against those differences. And then there's some people that say, the differences is what makes us better. The difference is, is, is you know, how we become richer as a nation. And immigration is about rights. It's about the rights that you have as a human being, whether you're in South Africa, whether you're in Mozambique, whether you're in the United States, but it's also about citizenship rights. So as a citizen, you get certain privileges that you don't get um, you know, in, if you're not a citizen. So those are the kind of the debates that we're having. And immigration is also a continuum. We talk about immigrants like they're all just one monolithic group. But in the United States, at least, this is kind of the continuum we have. We have 40, 43 million, over 43 million people of the United States population who are immigrants. So that is a huge population of people. And um, we start with people who are citizens. Now there's two ways to become a citizen in the United States. One is that you're born there, and the other is that you become naturalized, which is what I did in that picture with my mom. We were swearing to be good people of the United States. Um, I think one of the things you have to say is if need, if need be, you need to like, carry weapons, like, it's just like, you know, like protect the country, it's just very weird. Um, but citizenship is the only permanent status. So for example, if you came to the United States as a temporary resident, let's say you came as an international student, and then you overstayed your visa, right? You, you graduated, you didn't get a job that would sponsor you, then you become undocumented, right? Um, so it is not something that, it's something that you can move across. People move, as I said, from one status to the other, and before Trump became our president, I would have told you that citizenship is the only safe status. Because as a legal permanent resident, you can still get deported. And up to a certain time, it was very, for very minor offenses like marijuana possession. 
right? But that, but with the Trump administration, especially people who are not white. And then what we have is also many families who are mixed status. So maybe the parents are undocumented, but their children were born in the United States, and as a result, their children are US citizens, right? So it's not just so clear, like everyone's here, everyone's there. You move, and then families are dynamic as well. Um, so what I thought is I'd show you, since you said that we can now sing and dance, if we want to sing and dance. Um, so I took, I took notes of that, so feel free. I want to show you a part of a video um, to kind of show the life of a young person who came to the United States as an undocumented immigrant. Um, this is uh, Alexis Torres Machado. He was born in the country of Uruguay in South America. I'm going to show you just part of the video. Inigrantes is the word immigrant in Spanish, and it's a car mate, so it's a great multilingual space. I'm just going to play a little bit. If you want to dance, go, and it's multilingual. Children being beaten, kicked, and sexually abused in these border holding facilities. 
We have families that are, for years, going to be separated from their children. Sometimes the parents are deported and the children are still in the United States. Sometimes the children don't recognize their parents when they are reunited with them. So it is really horrific what is going on under this administration. We have ICE. Um, creating raids. Um, in Mississippi, they raided and detained over 600 immigrants in chicken poultry factories. 600 immigrants who, it was their children's first day of school. So, and this was something planned very far in advance, so the children came home and, and their, you know, their families, their mothers or their fathers or both weren't there. In detention, we have had 24 immigrants die in ICE custody. So we are in a very tragic state in the United States with what is happening with how we are treating immigrants, but it's only some immigrants. Um, the, the president is um, would like to remove the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment started after slavery, right, when we said all humans count as individuals. You cannot just say they, they don't count as citizens, as humans. So that was when the Fourth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment, came into being. That we said every individual who was born into this country, no matter the color of their skin, is a U.S. citizen. And he would like to remove that. He would like to remove it by an executive order, but he doesn't realize that that's actually not possible. So during the presidency, the uh, the campaign. I would like to show you some of the quotes that our current president has said. I'm not going to read them out loud because I don't want to, but it contextualizes what the, the sentiment between the U.S. and Mexico. By the way, um, Mexico's not paying for the wall right now. He's passed legislation for the United States to pay for the wall, so we have marked your words. Um, so what has happened after this whole thing is what, what, we, what the Pew um, Southern Poverty Law Center has called the Trump effect, right? And the Trump effect is incidents that have been reported in nearly every state across the country, the largest portion, not surprisingly, being um, on university and K-12 campuses. I think K-12 would be like R-12 here, is that right? Like, would you say that? Um, so mostly these incidences are anti-immigrants and anti-Muslim. Many Muslims are immigrants, not all, right? But some. But in addition to anti-immigrant and Muslim, we've seen anti the rise of anti-black, anti-Semitic, anti-lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and queer, anti-women, and um, white nationalists, and white nationalism is really um, picking up in the United States, and also anti-Trump. So we have seen students in schools being told, that, especially if their skin is not white, to go back home, often when they're born in the United States. We've had schools where um, students have started to chant, build that wall, build that wall, where students feel like their parents are going to be taken away from them. So it's a very hard place to be. And a study by Patricia Gantara at the Civil Rights Project shows us there's been really strong impacts on children who are immigrants, but also children who are, whose parents are immigrants as well, right? Because they're dealing with this. So what's happening? Um, a lot of them have untreated health problems right now. They're scared to get help. Um, high rates of anxiety, depression, and toxic stress. If you don't know from one day to the other what's going to happen, behavioral and emotional problems. And we all know as educators, when students exhibit behavioral and emotional problems, there's something going on, right? We need to like kind of dig deeper. Um, a decline in academic performance and long-term absence is all of a sudden students are no longer in the class. And that not only affects the student, but it affects like, hey, where'd my friend go? We don't know. And it's also had an effect on teachers. Um, teachers have also felt a sense of depression, of trauma, a sense of helplessness. Like, I'm here to help my children, I'm here to support my children, but what can I do under this regime? And a crumbling sense of community. So with that context, I'd like to um, tell you a little, a little bit about what's happening between the U.S. and Mexico. And remember, Mexico and the U.S. share a border. 
So what's actually been happening is more people, more Mexicans living in the United States have been going back to Mexico than Mexicans coming to the United States. There's been a shift. The reason people return, some of them are deported by ICE, for example. Some of them just the difficulties of being undocumented in the United States and choose to return for that reason. And then there's some people that say, you know what, I'm going to come to the United States, make some money, and then um, go back and, and live a nice life, you know, in my home country. So what we have right now in Mexico is 650,000 U.S. born and educated students. Students that come mostly speaking English, students that come with a U.S. frame of reference, and Mexico is not used to receiving those children. Mexico is used to sending people to the United States, not receiving them. So it's caused kind of some, some trouble there, some confusion. And before I tell, share with you what's happening, I want to tell you that I'm going to use the terminology transborder to talk about these people. Why? Because they cross physical borders, right? The U.S.-Mexico border, most clearly. But even borders between states. They cross borders of named languages when they travel from one place to another. They cross cultural borders, and they cross the borders of school systems, which change from, from nation to nation and even state to state. They've also been referred to as transnational, binational, return migrants, and deportees. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about why people return when they're not deported, when they, when they. Sometimes it's to see their families. Especially if you've been apart from your parents, your parents are aging, you want to see your parents before they die, right? So the only way to do that is to return. So family is actually the number one reason people return. Um, the challenges of living undocumented. So when you're undocumented, you don't get paid as much money, right? Sometimes you get paid under the table. If you're a woman, if you're a single woman and you're caring for children, that makes things much harder. You don't have as much support. The fear and the discrimination of every day not knowing what's going to happen under this government, and also isolation, and you can't, in some places, you can't get a driver's license. So I live in New York City, and my name's the cats, you know that the subway is perfect, the bridges, the tunnel, everything works. But in most states in the United States, you can wait like two hours for a bus, you know, and it'll take you all right. So, so we don't have good public transportation in most places, so not having a driver's license really debilitates people. Um, some people return because of health issues. Now, in the United States, if you go to a hospital and something is urgent, they will help you, they will you know, take care of you, no questions asked, whether you have insurance, whether you don't have insurance. But if you have a terminal illness or a long-term illness and you need constant care, that's where insurance comes in. So if people don't have that, sometimes they go back to where um, they were born. And in Oaxaca, the place where, um, in Mexico, I'm gonna tell you about, People um, have cultural and religious obligations as well for their communities and their towns and go back to be in charge of that. So this is a study I did. Um, I, was, I, I was honored to receive a Fulbright to go to Mexico and I thought what I would look at is the other side of deportation. So looking at what happens when people are after they're deported and what happens to their children. But what actually found that wasn't that many people that were deported but it was people that chose to return to repatriate. And I use the word choose very loosely because when you feel like you don't have any other choice, it's not really a choice, right? So I did um, qualitative methods. I interviewed the transborder students, their families and teachers. I spent some time observing in their classrooms and I asked them to create art and poetry. And I looked at three groups of students, primary students who were born in the United States to undocumented parents. And between the US and Mexico, they can have dual citizenship, so they can go back and forth. I looked at secondary students who were born in the United, born in Mexico, and then maybe when they were six months, one year, two years, were brought to the United States. So as we all know, if you're that little, that's all really you know, is you know, where you were grown up, where you were raised. And then tertiary, like right, college students who were raised in the US, but on their own, decided to return. So that's very different than children, because most children don't have a choice, right? Like your parents say we're going, and you can say I don't want to go, but you're going, right? So this is where I did my research in Oaxaca. Oaxaca is in the southern state of Mexico, so you see here's the border between the US and Mexico. 
And so New York is here where I am, and so none of these places are right on the border, right? They're kind of, kind of quite far from the border. Oaxaca, because of its mountainous region, I think has been able to preserve their indigenous um, heritage. So there is um, 16 official languages in Oaxaca. They're indigenous languages, but 16, just like the 11 here, doesn't capture the complexity. Because one language, Zapoteco, in different villages, you would speak it differently. So if I live in one village and you live in another, we may not even understand each other, even though we speak Zapoteco. So it's a very um, complex linguistic landscape. So in, um, I want to look at each group of students. So these are the primary students. Um, these um, to this, well, this is the mother, Alberta, and she has three children. Two are pictured here, and one says, I don't know how we learned English, just that we were born speaking English, right? And that's how children learn language, like they don't learn it in these formal ways. And I asked them to draw, the, compare their experiences between the U.S. and Mexico, and here's one drawing where the United States, you see is like this, like, so high building with the U.S. flag, but then Mexico, has their son in Mexico, apparently. Um, there's their family, kinder, and just like more life, right? More people, because that's what they remember. Um, here's one student that wrote, I want to live with my mom and dad um, on both sides, and I would like the government to help me. So her dad was in the United States, her mom was in Mexico. So these are children that understand that they are separated from their families, and it is the government is keeping them from being with either their mom and their dad at the same time. But children also sometimes feel more free, right? So um, I asked, um, I asked the girls, you know, you didn't know Mexico. It was your first time here. So what happened when you arrived? And Carla said, Mexico is more fun. And Axiane said, here you have much more space in my house. My grandfather says I run like a wild horse. Because in the United States, they talk about they're in these little apartments. They can't go outside. They can't do anything. So they feel more free once they um, leave. Um, and then they, I also asked them who do they miss, and they said they miss their dad. And then um, Carla says, um, we miss him, he's never coming here. But Axine, her sister says, he says in the end, in January, he's going to come because we'll be ready to build a house. The dad sends money to the family from the United States and kind of tells them, yeah, I'll be coming, I'll be coming, but he has no plans to come because as soon as he comes, he won't be able to return. But while they're separated from their dad, they're reunited with their grandparents. So separation and unification at the same time. Um, for secondary students, um, it's a bit of a different situation. Um, this is um, Shadeli, you're going to meet her in the film. She says, well, I have this belief that everyone in life deserves to be happy, but sometimes you don't get that opportunity. When these students talk about their life in the United States, they talk about it like this perfect, amazing life. So Brian says, I like that in school, I don't have to wear a uniform. By the way, in the United States, in most public schools, you don't wear uniforms, except in New York City. Um, they don't order me to cut my hair. You can have it as long as you want. We have birthday parties in there, and I like all my life, like when I live there, because it's so perfect, so beautiful, that place. And I think you can think about, like, the farther you get from something, you just remember the good stuff, like the bad stuff kind of fades away. Um, in terms of their language practices, within one family, um, the parents will speak Zapoteco to each other, right? Because that is their home language, the indigenous language. But the parents sometimes don't teach Zapoteco to their children because they feel their children will be discriminated against. So to their children, they speak Spanish. And the children who grew up together speak English. So talk about multilingualism, talk about translanguaging, right? This is the reality. This is, there is no monolingualism, like Professor Macalela um, explained in the beginning. But then we look at what happens when they go to school. Well, when they go to school, every, almost all their classes are in English, math, science, social studies. I'm, I'm sorry, Spanish, right? Everything is in Spanish. And they have one English class. But the English class is for people that never spoke English before, that never learned English. So I sat in on one of these classes. This is how the class goes. Okay, boys and girls, repeat after me. Noon, 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 noon is 12, say noon. And I'm just sitting there like, oh my gosh, I can't. But these are what these children who grew up in the United States are experiencing every day. 
And then with their indigenous languages, that is, they're, they're completely invisible in the schools. And the students will not even want to tell you that they speak an indigenous language because they will think you feel, you, you, you will feel bad, you know, you will degrade, degrade them for speaking that. I'm gonna skip this. Um, so what's interesting in these camp families is that, um, so I'm actually I'm gonna skip this because I wanna get to the film. Um, they're, these two students are often not recognized because they were born in Mexico or because they're, they look Mexican just like their peers. So this is Melchor saying, he said to my, none of my teachers knew that I didn't grow up here until I told them. I'm not really good because they came from the US. I said, just speak slower, give me extra classes. Then they were helpful. First, they just looked at me and said, how could you come from the US? You look like a normal Mexican that speaks Spanish. Right, so sometimes when we think about immigrants, it's that they look different, but in this case, they look just like everyone else. And finally, with transborder college students, these are students that graduated from high school in the U.S. And Jawazin there says, my first motivation to come back was to continue my studies. The second was racism. So Jawazin, um, the same woman says, I told my parents, after I finish high school, I'm moving back to Mexico because I want to keep studying and here I'm not going to do that. They thought I was kidding. The last day of school, I was like, I need my plane ticket. I want to go. That's when they saw that I was serious. So Josie was living in South Carolina where they banned undocumented students from attending college. So it was one of the more restrictive states. So she said, I'm out of here. Her parents didn't believe her. She left on her own. A year later, her father was driving without a license because when you're undocumented, you can't get a license. He was pulled over for a broken taillight and he was deported. And then the mom followed after that. So now most of the family is in Mexico, but one of her brothers is still in the United States. Again, separation, unification. Um, Something that I found sport to be something that connects people across borders. So this is Enrique, and he talked about he came back and he was kind of depressed. When you go to the U.S. and come back, all eyes are on you. I felt weird. At first, I didn't go out of my, my house a lot. I remember telling my mom that I wanted to come back to the U.S. One day, there was like a soccer tournament, and my uncle invited me, and we started talking and hanging out. That's where I started feeling more comfortable. So there's always something that kind of is your anchor across borders, and for him, it was soccer. So a lot of the students, I'm, I'm going to skip this, but a lot of the students um, become English teachers because English is a resource that they have, even though they maybe would not have done so in the first place. So what I'm going to share with you now is the film that we created to share with a broader audience the realities of return migration. So the film is in English, it is in Spanish with English subtitles, and it is in Zapoteco, which is the indigenous language, and that is in with English and Spanish subtitles. So it's a half an hour film, and I don't know if it's possible to turn the lights off, that would be great, but I'm gonna go ahead and start it now. <laughs> Oh, 
when I was in a puzzle then, it just the last person to try to measure it. But I thought like, you know, I need a constant time. I didn't know where it was. I guess I was sure enough. I turned around and saw, uh, saw the US, US side and the Mexican side. I'm like, I can't believe I'm living on this side. I had a dream. This dream I had that has died for me. My name is Barreta. I am from La Fiesta, Guadalajara. So I felt that I wanted to meet my parents, my grandparents too. 
And I was excited to come here because I wanted to find out how my culture is. When I first came back to Mexico, my, my emotions were always angry because I was always reproaching at my mom. Why you took me back? I, I want to return. I don't want to be here. Why you took me back? 